around six o'clock in the morning, got a panicked phone call from Harry Cohn saying, give Sinatra the part. I don't want to hear anything else about this. If this is beginning to sound a little bit like a movie that you may know of called The Godfather. This episode is brought to you by the best-selling book, Rise of the Film Entrepreneur: how to turn your independent film into a money-making business. Learn more at filmbizbook.com. I'd like to welcome to the show, Stephen Simon. How you doing, Stephen? Hey, and it was so easy doing this. <laughs> Alex and took, I just had 20 minutes took us to figure out how to do this on Zoom. But anyway, it's good to talk to you, Alex. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on the show, my friend. I've I've been a fan of your work for many, many years. You've brought me much love and tears and spiritual enlightenment uh, through the works that you've done over the years. And we're going to get into the into the weeds of your career. But my first question is, why in God's green earth did you want to get into this insanity that is the film industry? And how did you get in? <laughs> uh, well, first of all, thank you for the kind words. Um, I was actually born into the industry. Um, my dad was a writer, producer, and a studio head at Columbia in the late 40s. Um, he made movies like uh, Born Yesterday with Judy Holliday that she won an Academy Award for. And he was running Columbia Studios um, as the head of production there when he died very suddenly at the age of 40 from a cerebral hemorrhage. Oh, wow. um, my mother remarried another film producer. Um, so we stayed uh, in the industry. And I, very early on in my life, had an experience where I was saying to my mother and my stepfather, there's a man in my wall at night. And of course, they thought I was nuts. This is probably 1954, 53. Mm -hmm. And, the, oh, are you scared? No, I'm not scared. You know, he's, he's really wonderful. I like him a lot. Well, it took me a long time to realize that was the spirit of my dad. Oh, wow. And my dad constantly was encouraging me. And I know that I came to this life to be a filmmaker and to make films of a spiritual nature um, that would hopefully be uplifting. I mean, when I was a kid, I loved It's a Wonderful Life, uh, The Ghost and Mrs. Muir, Lost Horizon. Those were my movies. Mm -hmm. So I knew I wanted to do this. Um, I don't hold this against me, please. It's been a long time. <laughs> I don't have to go to meetings anymore, but I was a lawyer for a short period of time. <laughs> um, I know that that's not something that, that people like to usually admit, but I was. But I knew I was supposed to get into the film industry. I was surrounded by it. And one day I walked into a bookstore. The guy that was the clerk knew I loved books of, that would be called at that point fantasy books. And he said, well, there's a great new book by Richard Matheson who had written a lot of the Twilight Zone episodes and movies like I Am Legend and things like that. It was called Bid Time Return. And I read the book in one sitting and I said, that's it. I got to get into the industry. Uh, my, my dad's mentor was a man named Ray Stark. Mm -hmm. And Ray was a major league producer in the film industry. Uh, funny Girl, Funny Lady, Annie, a whole bunch of big movies. And I went and begged Ray for a job and said, I got to get this movie made, Ray. I got to learn how to produce. It's a longer story than that, but he hired me. The very first thing I did was call Richard Matheson's agent. We set up a meeting and I said to him, look, I don't know how long it's going to take, but it's the movie I got into the business to make. And three years later, we produced Somewhere in Time, which was based on Bid Time Return. And then he gave me the galleys to what dreams may come. That took 20 years. That's a whole other story. And we'll get and we'll get to that that amazing film in a minute. But uh, before we get into somewhere uh, somewhere in time, is it true that Frank Sinatra was your godfather? He was. Um, he was. Um, so my dad was running Columbia when he bought a book for them called From Here to Eternity to make into a film. Right. And my dad was, this is 1948, 49. Um, my dad was a big fan of Sinatra's. What a lot of people don't know is that at that point, Frank's career had really gone into the toilet, as he would say, because he had made a lot of bad movie choices. He uh, hemorrhaged his vocal cords and couldn't sing for a while. My father was a big fan and <laughs> he called him and he said, hey, look, I got a part for you called Maggio. That's the character in From Here to Eternity. I think it'd be great for you 
you want to read it? And Frank was, yeah, absolutely. He read it. He called my dad. He said, I love this part. This is what I need to get back on track. My dad gave him the part. And then Harry Cohn, who headed the studio at Columbia at that time, uh, called my father in and said, uh, no, not Sinatra. You can have anybody but Sinatra. Is this story beginning to sound a little familiar, Alex? Mm -hmm. It should. Mm -hmm. It should. Um, so my father said, why? And Harry wouldn't tell him why. But it was over a woman um, who I believe was Kim Novak. I think it was mm -hmm. Kim Novak. I'm not 100% mm -hmm. sure. So my father said, I can't, you can't do this to me, Harry. Um, I, I told the guy, I'm the head of production. My, my word will be ruined. And Harry Cohn, in his inimitable kind way, said, who gives a damn about your, your reputation? No. Just as an aside, Red Skelton once had a great comment about Harry Cohn. When Harry Cohn died, about 3,000 people showed up for his funeral. And Red said, see, give people what they want, they'll show up. <laughs> um, anyway, so my dad quit, went home around six o'clock in the morning, got a panicked phone call from Harry Cohn saying, give Sinatra the part. I don't want to hear anything else about this. If this is beginning to sound a little bit like a movie that you may know of called The Godfather, uh, and that's because it is. It was based on that episode and no, the horse's head was not cut off. Red Skelton told me this story a long, much longer after this because Red was my dad's best friend, my birth dad's best friend. Right. Um, but Harry owned a great racehorse who was poisoned in his stall. And there was a note put under Harry's door saying, you're next. Um, as far as I know, Frank knew nothing about that. And I never talked to Frank about that because that was just not a subject that we wanted to deal with. But from that point forward, after my dad died, Frank became Uncle Frank. And there were always these great gifts from him. And when I was 18, I was called to his house to talk to him. And at that point, he told me the story about my father. And he said, your dad was a stand-up guy. He really <laughs> saved my career, Stephen. I never got a chance to repay him. You now have to consider me your unofficial godfather and we're gonna have some fun together. And I spent a few years traveling with him and wow. it, it was an extraordinary time. I, I often feel Alex like Forrest Gump. I, I just wound up being in the right place at the right time with a whole bunch of really fascinating people. That's an amazing story. So that so that whole story is the kind of basis of where the, the that scene in The Godfather came in. Correct. That's, that is remarkable. That the whole I love the Forrest Gump analogy. It's it seems <laughs> as as we continue with our conversation, that will start to make more and more sense. Uh, <laughs> the way your your career is gone makes sense to me, boy. You just be in the right place at the right time, and fascinating things happen. I've had a very very lucky, fortunate life. So you've also worked with two. You know, you were working with two legends. One was Neil Simon, uh, yes. and another one was Dino De Laurentiis you know, the legendary yes. producer. So, so first question, what was it like working with Neil? And did you get, what kind of, what kind of lessons did you learn from working with someone like Neil Simon? So when I got my job with Ray Stark, when I begged my way into that job, Ray had a multi-picture deal with Neil, who was mm -hmm. at that time, the number one playwright in the world. He'd had so many huge hits and Ray had already made a couple of movies with him. And we were doing I think we were starting to, it was the, a movie called The Chief Detective with uh, Peter Falk and this great ensemble cast. And there was gonna be a reading with the cast of the script one night, I'll never forget this, at Trader Vic's restaurant in Beverly Hills. And Ray said to me, we're going and I want you to sit next to Neil and just watch Neil while he operates. And I said, okay. So we have all these actors in a room who are in awe of Neil Simon and Neil says, Look, I just want you to read the script, guys. You don't have to, you don't have to act. You don't do anything. Just read the script. I need to know what it sounds like. So they started, and I watched Neil make notes in his script in a big red pen. And he would make notes like, no, big cross out, change it. Joke doesn't work. This is bad. This is good. Keep. And he did that all the way through the reading. And when it was over, he said to everybody, I really appreciate that. That's what I needed. I, it's very clear to me, I've got to rewrite about half of this stuff. 
So I got to do a big rewrite on the script. We'll do another reading when I'm ready, but thank you. And he went away to rewrite. So when it was over and it was just Neil and Ray and I, I said to him, Neil, how the heck do you do that? How can you keep objectivity? He said, Stephen, a joke is only funny if other people laugh. If, if other people laugh, it doesn't matter what I think of it. It's not funny. I've got to, I've got to make it work where people actually laugh, he said. And I also have this device where when I'm doing my own rewrites, I pretend I have been hired to rewrite the work of somebody I don't like. And it's very easy for me to change the words. Now, I was raised Jewish, Neil was Jewish, Ray was Jewish. If you're Jewish, you get that attitude, <laughs> okay? <laughs> and that's so amazing. That, that was Neil, and it was fascinating watching him operate. And I still think at that time, uh, Neil's contract was the only writer in Hollywood that you could not change his work, his words, without his permission. I think he was the only guy that had that. And as far as I know, he may be the only guy that ever got that. But it was, again, it was just fascinating being in the presence of that kind of genius. I think I think Sorkin might have that. And I think Tarantino might have that at this point in the could game. Be. Could well be, been. but but there's it's a short, very short list, <laughs> to say the least. Now, you also got to work with Dino De Laurentiis, who is a legendary film producer, I mean, I'm sure you've got stories you could tell on air and I'm sure you got stories you could tell off air as well. <laughs> so what I'll lessons did you, you learn as a producer, for producer to producer, how did, what lessons did you learn from him? Oh, so many. Uh, Dino was a unique individual. You know, Dino almost single-handedly launched the Italian film industry. Uh -huh. Dino got his start in life selling, quote, holy water, unquote, to American GIs during World War II that he had basically just gotten out of the river. I mean, <laughs> he, I, we used to get to work very early, he, which was great because I'm an early bird as well. We used to get to the office at seven in the morning. And for the first hour, Dino would regale me with stories. And I, I almost felt like I should have been paying him because the stories were extraordinary about how he got started how his films worked. And you know, Dino pioneered selling off individual rights to films overseas. And that's how you get your film made. So he was the one that started all of that. He would get a domestic deal, he'd sell it here in France, he'd sell it here in Germany. And then eventually, this is a whole other story, which is a long story, which we won't go into, but eventually we distributed a film outside the United States. Um, which was Madonna's documentary, which we called outside the United States in Dino's inimitable way, which we called uh, In Bed with Madonna. And Madonna during that time, I had not met her, but at that time she was the most famous woman in the world. Oh, absolutely. And she told Dino she wanted to do a movie like um, uh, the Sharon Stone movie. Um, uh, Basic Instinct. Basic Instinct, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, that's what happens when you get to 76. You have those little brain freezes from a time to time. <laughs> and so Dino said to me, I've done the numbers. You got to find a really sexy script that she wants to do. You got to make it for $18 million. If you do, we can pre-sell it for 23. And then we don't have to worry about anything else. And it's your job. And I said, okay. Um, and it scared the but Jesus out of me. I'd been through a very difficult divorce at that time. I had declared bankruptcy at that time. I had just gotten my job with Dino, which I did not want to lose. So I called Madonna's assistant and said, you know, this is going to be my position. I would really like to meet with her. And she was renting a house in the Hollywood Hills. And we set up the meeting for whatever it was. And I came in and she was in the living room sitting on the couch and came up and shook my hand. She was very, very nice. And we sat on opposite sides and she said, what, what can I do for you? And I said, I'm going to be really frank with you. You scare me to death. And she got this little smile and she said, well, tell me about that. And I told her, I said, I need this job. Um, it's my job to keep this movie on schedule and on budget. If you don't like the way I say good morning, you can get me fired. I know that. I've been told I can be honest with you. I'm being honest with you. What is it going to take for me to make this work for you? 
And I'll never forget this as long as I live. She launched herself off the couch and I actually thought she was coming toward me to hit me. I actually thought she was gonna slap me. Right. And I stood up and she gave me a big hug and she said, Stephen, if you're that honest with me about everything all the way through this, we are gonna be great friends because I want you at the end of the film to say to everybody how professional I was and because a lot of people have different ideas about me and we're not gonna have any problems, I promise you. And she was just an absolute delight to work with the entire way through, she kept her word. And uh, Dino and I finally had a parting of the ways, but working with him during those years was utterly fascinating because I, I learned how to actually get movies financed in a very unconventional way. And he was one of the great giants of the industry and I really loved him very dearly. And he was, so he was, he, he started the whole pre-selling. All the pre-selling was, Dino originated all of that. Right. Cause I mean, I know the, um, the Cannon boys uh, started taking that to the next level in the eighties where they just throw a well, poster a up took it to the next level. But you know, he was the one that he, he is the one that did it. And he made a lot of, you know, incredible films in Italy with Fellini and, Sure. Uh, he he was, he, I think Dino may have had his name on three or 400 movies by the end of his career. I may be exaggerating that, but I don't think so. And um, he, as I said, he I, I, I was given the opportunity to work for two of the last great moguls, Ray Stark and Dino De Laurentiis. And I, I was, it was a gift to me. I, I much appreciated it. And as a producer, you must have picked up a lot of tools in your toolbox along the way. I sure did. I learned a lot of things that I wanted to do, and I learned a lot of things I didn't want to do. <laughs> <laughs> so that's fascinating because I remember when Body of Evidence, which is that Madonna film, came out. Uh, it wasn't. I mean, it was. You know, it wasn't a, a success. I mean, it was a success, but it wasn't like they wanted it to, to be this whole thing. I think there was just so much press about her, and she was so so. But, you know, she was so dividing and, and, and polarizing. So it was just a difficult. Well, I'll tell you what happened with that. Um, yeah. We previewed Body of Evidence and the previews were really successful. This was I, I can't remember the time of the year, but it was maybe yeah. six months before the film was going to be released, maybe right. four, four to six months. But but after the previews, but before the film came out, Madonna's sex book came out. Yes. And it changed a lot of the public perception of Madonna. And we went back and previewed it again. MGM released it uh, domestically. And um, uh, Laddie Allen Ladd, who was running MGM, said, we need to test this again. And the tests were much different. And it was mostly because a lot of the audience had changed their attitude about Madonna. Um, I have to tell you, though, recently I got a phone call from somebody in England saying that they were doing a special Blu-ray release of Body of Evidence because it's become quite a cult film in Europe mm -hmm. and is wildly successful. And I did some interviews with them and I, I think that's gonna be coming out sometime in the fall. So it did find its audience. I watched it recently again yeah. and I, it, the level, the, the heat in that movie, the explicitness of that movie oh, and man. he, uh, she and, and, and Willem together were, really extraordinary and i went whoa man I, I forgot it was that explicit and um anyway it, it was a fun movie to work on and she was great willem was great it was a wonderful experience so let's go to somewhere in time which was your first producing credit uh it is it is one of those films that just is a classic it keeps going and going and going and people love love that film it was a young christopher reeve a young jane seymour I mean, this is this is post Superman, Christopher Reeve. So he was a big star in 1979, 1980. I mean, he was a massive star at that time. Uh, what what were the lessons that that you learned to get that thing off the ground? How did you you know, how did you I mean, I know the world is so different now, but are there any universal lessons you learned during that process? Uh, no. Uh, again, I just I, I wanted right to be in the right place. I wanted to be in the right place at the right time. Um, I'll tell you the story because it's a fun story. So I had had really helped push through Smokey and the Bandit with Universal for Ray mm -hmm. Stark when I was working for Ray. I did not produce Smokey and the Bandit. A guy named Mort Engelberg did. I really had very little to do with that. But as an executive, I helped it get through. So Universal was grateful. 
There was also a guy named Jeannot Swark who wound up uh, directing Somewhere in Time who had come in and saved them on Jaws 2. He replaced the original uh, director on that. So Jeannot and I got together and he was saying, oh, I want to make an old fashioned romantic movie like um, The Ghost and Mrs. Muir uh, or something like that. And I said, oh, here's the book. And he said, yeah, we got to do this. So we went to Universal to, to make a deal with them to develop the script. And as I know, there was a great guy named Ned Tannen running, Ned, Ned Tannen running the studio at that time. I know he did that as a gesture of gratitude to, to both Jeannot and to myself, but I don't, I don't think that they ever really totally intended to make the movie. So in every movie, with every script, there is a moment of truth with the studio. And we had developed the script, we got called into Ned's office, we went into Ned's office and Ned said, you know, I love you guys. Immediately, I knew that the biggest butt in the world was coming. Mm -hmm. And I, he was about to say, and he admitted it later, he was about to say, but we just can't get behind this. And I just blurted out to him, what if we get Christopher Reeve? I thought Janot was going to kill me. And at that point, I felt like killing myself because this is January of 1980. Superman had opened in December of 1979. Chris was the biggest star in the world at that point. There was no way we were gonna get him for a movie that we had budgeted at $5 million and the star at 500,000. So immediately Ned said, huh, you got Christopher Reeve for his first movie after Superman? You got a green light. And I immediately tried to backtrack and go with, what about this one? And he said, no. And I said, so what if we don't get Chris Reeve? And he said, don't come back, Stephen. And I'm like, okay. So Jano and I walk out uh, and he said, what am I gonna, I'm, 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 I said, I'm gonna call his agent. So I called his agent who I will not name. And his agent said, that little time travel thing you have, there's no chance he's gonna do that. I'm getting offers like three or $4 million offers for him. Remember this is 40 years ago. So that was yeah. a lot of money. That's huge. And I said, well, you gotta give him the script. And he said, no, I'm not even gonna show it to him because I'm telling you he won't do it. So Jeannot said, what are we going to do? And I said, well, I have a crazy idea. Desperate people do desperate things. If you've been in LA, you're in LA. So you know that on Sunset Boulevard in West LA, they sell maps to the stars' homes. No, you didn't. No, you did oh, not. Yes. Oh, yes, we did. I got it. We did. And I, I, he, Jeannot was like, this is humiliating. What are you doing? And I said, Jeannot, what harm can it do? Let's look. So, you know, I know that a lot of that stuff is totally made up because right. it, unless Bruce Willis is mowing the lawn in front of his house, right? How do you know if Bruce Willis lives there? So Chris is listed somewhere in the Hollywood Hills. So I said, we're going. He said, no, we're not. I said, we're going. And he, originally he didn't even want to get out of the car. So we go up to this and he's laughing and he says, you're going to feel like the biggest idiot in the world. We knock on the door and Chris answers the door. You gotta be kidding me. Now, Chris later said that my jaw went like, <laughs> we were both shocked. And I think I got out something like, you know, I'm a producer, he's a director, we got a movie at Universal. But what Chris told me later was the thing that intrigued him is when I said, your agent won't show you the script. And he said, oh, okay, well, have you got a script? We ran to the car, gave him a script. He said, give me your phone number, I'll call you tomorrow. So oh, he my. called me and he said, get your director, come up to the house. We did. We walked in. He said, I've got two things to tell you. Number one, this is going to be my next movie. Oh. Number, two, number two, I just fired my agent. Um, his agent never spoke to me again, which I don't blame him for. And that's how we got Chris Reeve. I mean, it was just a fluke. And he later said to me that he had his agent had given him a script where he was supposed to play a Viking. A and he Viking. said, I have visions of me wearing one of those big helmets with the, all the horns and stuff. And when I saw this beautiful little love story, I said, this is what I want to do. And, you know, getting Jane Seymour was a whole other story. But anyway, that's how we got the movie approved. Holy cow. So what you're telling everybody to do is if you're a young producer in Hollywood, you go get them get the maps and then go <laughs> knock out the door of the actor. You know what? what? You got to do what you got to do. I mean, it, I didn't know what else to do. How are we going to find him if this agent wouldn't help him? Again, um, I have been unbelievably lucky 
in my life Jeez. to be at the right place at the right time. And I, I'm, I feel very blessed by that. And it was an extraordinary shoot. The movie came out bombed totally with nice. at the box office and with critics. Um, it was devastating. I grew this beard 40 years ago, October of 1980, when the movie came out, haven't shaved it since. And it took a long time, but the movie, and I won't waste your time with how, but the movie really wound up getting seen on cable TV and on the first yes. page channel in LA called the Z channel. Yeah. Um, and it, and it, it built up an audience. And uh, th now there's a weekend devoted to it at the Grand Hotel every October. The whole hotel, which is I think six or 700 rooms, is taken up by fans of the film who come bringing trunks of 1912 clothing. They get dressed in costume all weekend. There are all kinds of events around the film. And, uh, it has become a wonderful little cult film, and I, I'm really proud that it's finally found its audience. Did you have you ever gone to that event? Oh yeah, I, I went a couple of times. Absolutely, yeah. Oh my god, that must be. yeah. Because I remember the movie when it came out. I mean, I was I, I don't remember when it came out, but I, I remember it in my video store days. I was in the the video store. I worked at a video store from eighty seven to ninety two, ninety three, something like that, and. Uh, and I remember the the box and it would always rent. Like it was always renting constantly. And I remember watching, I was like, this is such a beautiful film. Even in my high school days when I was a knucklehead, I really was still touched by the film. But it is one of those films that just got a cult following over the years and really found its audience. I mean, a lot of a lot of movies found their audience during the VHS boom and the cable boom, like because it was just being played. Like get Terminator was just played on loop. <laughs> on hbo for absolutely for, for a long time H hbo was one of the you know when they first started they couldn't afford to buy big hits so they bought somewhere in time and they showed it a lot um it is a movie that is for really people with a very romantic heart and i have said to people you cannot watch this movie with your head you have to watch it with your heart because there are things in it like where did the watch come from originally that we, Richard Matheson finally came up with the right answer to that because uh, people who have seen the movie know that the old Elise gives the watch to the young Richard and says, come back. Richard goes back in time to the young Elise and leaves the watch there. And people, well, where'd the, where did the watch first start? And Richard's answer was somewhere in time. So, you know, it doesn't, a lot of it doesn't make logical sense. And I understand that but it is not a movie that you're supposed to watch here. You're supposed to watch it here. And people who are really have access to that part of themselves who are romantics really love that film. And then there are people who just think it is a slow, ridiculous 1940s melodra melodrama. And frankly, I had that same experience with what dreams may come. People either love it or hate it. And I personally would rather have people either love or hate a film that I've made than have it be like Chinese food, which is, hey, you know, it's OK, but I'm hungry again. OK, I I'm thrilled that people who love it really love it. And people who don't, I respect that. Everybody's got a right to their own taste and their own films. Now, you also got to work with a young actor uh, on a film called All the Right Moves. Uh, young young man, Mister Tom Cruise, yep. uh, when that first came, when he he was, was that pre risky business or post risky business? I don't remember. We hired uh, Tom right before he went to Chicago to star in Risky Business. Oh, very and shrewd! He, Again, he, right place at the right time, Forrest. <laughs> right place at the right time. Um, he li literally left the shoot in Chicago after they wrapped Risky Business and came to Johnstown, Pennsylvania, where we shot uh, All the Right Moves. So uh, I remember at that point, um, it was obvious when you sat in a room with Tom. I mean, I think I'd only seen him in Taps. Taps. I think yeah, he Taps, was in, yeah. and he was in some other movie that was a broad comedy about going to Tijuana or something. I don't oh, remember. Oh, God, yeah, Sure Thing. I think the Sure Thing or, uh, yeah, All the Right Moves, or not All the Right, I know what you were talking about. It's a really bad anyway, movie. Like, so, yeah, but you sat in a room with Tom, and there was, he had the most amazing presence. I think Tom was 21 at that time, 20 or 21. And 
it, it, it was so obvious that he was the guy that we wanted to hire. And I remember we had a big argument with Fox at that point because we were offering him $125,000 to star in the film, There's which I lot. think Tom makes per minute now. Per minute, um, <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> yeah. But, um, you know, that was an amazing shoot. And uh, it, again, the film was not a big hit at the box office, but definitely caught on later. Um, <laughs> as a friend of mine once said to me, Stephen, your career has been a study in, um, you were before your time. And he's, and my friend said to me, do you know what that also means? And I said, what? And he said, it means now you're wrong. And I'm like, okay, well, <laughs> as long as people catch up with it, you know, Kevin Costner had this great saying about, you can't really tell about your film when it first comes out, but if three or four years after it comes out, a couple of people are talking in a living room and somebody says, oh, have you ever seen this film? I got to show you this film. You, then you know you've made a successful film. And fortunately, with the films that I've been involved with, um, other than Bill and Ted, um, th these were not big commercial successes, the films that I did. But they found a life later on. And uh, I mean, and I, I, I've had the pleasure of talking to uh, one, of, one of those films that Kevin did, which is Waterworld which was obviously panned and it became one of Universal's biggest IPs ever. And it's made so much money over the years and it's found their audience. Uh, right. it, it, you know, it, you just don't know when it comes out and, and it could be 10 years later. I mean, if, I mean, I'm sure you know the movie, The Room, uh, that's sure. considered the worst movie ever made. And look what happened to that. Like it became this cult movie of being a movie that's so bad it trans i always say it's so bad it's now good <laughs> so it's 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 those things now you did mention bill and ted and i have to tell you before we get into your bill and ted story which i know because we spoke about it already but for the audience i just want to let you know uh, and uh, what bill and ted meant to me and i was working at the video store in 89 when it was released it was one of three releases of that week i never forgot because i could watch everything that came out weekly not like today, where you've got 50,000 movies a minute coming out. And I had just broken up with a girlfriend and I was depressed and I was down. And then I saw this thing with this ridiculous cover. I'm like, who is this Keanu? What? I can't even say his name. And they're in a, a phone booth. I'm like, let me take it home. Because I didn't even see the trailer because there was no YouTube to see trailers at that time, unless you, you caught it at the theater. And I took it home and the amount of laughter and joy that I got from that. I started off absolutely depressed and I finished that movie on a high. I was so happy and I just and I recommended it to everybody that walked into the video store. It is one of those films that just I mean, just connected with me. It's such a such a way. And I think it's connected, obviously, with an audience because there's so much love behind their stupidity. <laughs> The characters are so endearing and so loving. And yeah, they're buffoons. And yeah, they're kind of like, what? They're ridiculous. But so crates and, you know, the salad dressing dude. And like, it's just, it's just so, it was so wonderful. So please, I want to first of all say thank you for bringing that into the world because God knows we needed a little laughter. And secondly, tell this insane story of how you got involved with Bill and Ted's excellent adventure. Yeah, and I want to say very clearly that um, I did not produce Bill and Ted. I'm one of the executive producers on it. I take no credit for producing that movie in any way. It was done by Robert Court and Scott Krupp uh, and Ted Field at Interscope. Uh, I only was instrumental in saving it from being thrown away and getting it sold. And then I took another job, another executive job. So all of the credit for what happened in that film really does not belong to me. It belongs to those other producers. Richard Matheson, who was my mentor, who wrote Somewhere in Time and What Dreams May Come, the books, and he wrote the script for Somewhere in Time, had a son named Christian who was writing scripts when we were prepping um, Somewhere in Time and What Dreams May Come. Uh, no, because it was before Wet Dreams Might Come. It was somewhere in time. And Richard asked me to read a couple of the scripts, and they were very, very odd, really odd, but they had a 
incredibly dark, funny sense of humor. And Richard said to me, what do you think? And I said, well, I don't think this is going to get done. But if he could find somebody that's commercial to work with him, maybe it would work. Well, he found a guy named Ed Solomon, who had been working on Laverne and Shirley and some other things. <laughs> and they came up with Bill and Ted. And Richard called me one day and said, well, they wrote this script called Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. And their agents said that they don't want to distribute it around town because they think it will ruin their career. Um, that uh, no one will buy it, no one will make it, it's so dumb and blah, blah, blah. And he, he said, would you read it? And I said, yeah, I so I read it and I was howling just reading it. And I'm like, I don't know what's wrong with them, but I think I know where I can sell this. And a, a, a good friend of mine at that time, Robert Court, who had been a, um, an executive at both Columbia and Fox when I was both at Columbia and Fox, and was my executive on All the Right Moves, had just taken over a production company called Interscope. And I called Robert and he was, they were looking for material. And I said, I think you're gonna laugh your ass off. And the next day he called and he said, we want this. And so the guys went and met with him. I wasn't even in that meeting from what I understand. They did as good a Bill and Ted as Keanu and Alex did later on. And they made the movie and that was my only involvement. So I don't wanna take credit for any of the creative things that happened for the casting or anything else that was really Robert Court and Scott Krupp and Ted Field. But I was very glad that I could be instrumental in getting it started. I mean, you, again, in, in your Forrest Gump ways, uh, you yeah. fell into helping put out into the world Bill and Ted's excellent adventure. I mean, again, without you, the movie might have been lost to to time somewhere in time if you will uh it, it could have been lost and not mm -hmm. uh never seen the light of day and maybe that would have affected keanu's career and alex winter's career who knows but that one one motion set other things in motion so let's just say you're responsible for john wick and the matrix i'm just going to throw it out there <laughs> you are personally no i'm joking but no but no, but yeah. but but thank you but thank you for bringing it into the world because i thought like i told you it brought me so much laughter and yeah, so much so funny. joy very very, very yeah, funny. and then the bogus journey went to it and i even saw the new one that they just released uh as well and it was nice to see the boys back in action, doing their thing. It was, it was fantastic. Now, I mean, you, over the years, you've read probably thousands of scripts in, over the yeah. course of your career. Is Are there mistakes that you see screenwriters make again and again that you're just like, oh, God, I just wish, I wish they would just understand, don't do this? Well, it, it depends on the genre that they're writing in. Mm -hmm. And it also depends on whether it's their first script, because most writers in their first script write something that's autobiographical in some way or another. Um, and it's very hard to let go of it. Um, I think that the, the biggest thing that I find in working with writers, which I still do, is that they have to understand what they're what they're going for. And that it is called show business. There's a business side and there's a show side, but they have to find a way of melding. And you can't cross that kind, those kind of wires, and you have to really accept that. The biggest issue that I have with screenwriters often is that they don't take the Neil Simon advice. They aren't open to criticism, to saying this doesn't work. Um, you know, you've got to redo this. This is why this doesn't work. Um, I always say this is why I don't think it works because the film industry, as William Goldman said in his uh, famous book, Adventures in the Screen Trade, which is one of the greatest books ever written about the movie industry, mm -hmm. he had an incredible quote, which is, nobody knows anything. And there's a lot of truth in that. So I try to give a lot of leeway to writers. It's very important for writers to have a structure first. If you're going to build a house, you got to build the foundation and then you build the walls and, you know, you work inward and you do all of that stuff. You have to have a foundation. Um, I insist when I work with writers, if it's from scratch, that they do a very detailed outline first so that they know where they're going, which also alleviates the problem of sitting in front of an open computer saying, OK, now what do I do? You know, mm -hmm. um, there was that wonderful movie, about, and again, you'll remember the name of it. I don't right now. I think it was called 
something orchid uh, with, and it was, it was uh, Nicholas orchid? Cage. Oh, huh? wild orchid. Wild, I think it was Wild Orchid, where he oh, played. Oh no, you're thinking a, no, 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 you're thinking adaptation. Adaptation, that's it. Thank you. That's it. Yeah, yes. Uh, yeah, I think Wild Orchid was Mickey Rourke. Um, correct. Correct. Right. So, um, in adaptation, there's this wonderful scene that uh, several scenes where he sits down to write and it says, "I need a muffin," and he gets up and he gets a muffin and stuff like that, which is you know, and <laughs> one of the great things that I learned from a couple of writers is always end your day in the middle of a sentence. Mm -hmm. end your writing day in the middle of a sentence so when you come back the next day you know where to start and if you have a proper outline then you just have to connect the dots um ron bass was a very good friend of mine uh, in la and you know ron won the academy award for rain man and has written i don't know, i think 20 25 30 movies that have gotten made and ron used to have a crew of um young women working for him who he didn't like it when we, his friends did this, but we called them the Ronettes. And um, they would out, help him outline all, cause he, he was making a fortune and turning out these incredible scripts. They would help him outline everything he was gonna do in a script. So before Ron sat down to write it, he gave them the basic ideas of things and the characters, and then they would help him put the structure together and then Ron would refine it and he would know this scene's gonna take two pages, this scene's gonna take two and a half pages. He was always incredibly organized and it's very important to do that as a writer. You need to be organized, you need to know where you're going and then you need to have the ability to say, okay, maybe you're right, maybe I could do that differently. Um, and everyone else has you know, their own quirks and everything else, but for me, it's a lot of fun. The only type of work I do with writers now is on films that would be uplifting, um, that for me uh, need to have some kind of a spiritual side. It doesn't mean it has to be openly spiritual. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean religious, I mean spiritual. There's a difference. You can be very spiritual and not be tied to any particular religion. You can obviously be religious and very spiritual, but I'm talking about having some kind of a sense that this is gonna make people feel better mm -hmm. about who they are, about their lives, which we desperately need now. Oh my goodness, do we desperately need that? You know, Bill Maher said a, a year or two ago <laughs> in, a, in a rant about the movie industry, he said, do you think that maybe you guys could make a movie every once in a while that doesn't make me want to take a bath with a toaster? <laughs> right, it's a great line, right. I remember and that line. <laughs> during the pandemic, that was very true. Well, now we're out of that. And I think people are really looking for hope Again, they're looking to feel better again. It's so hard to do that when you look out in the world and you see all the conflict and all the anger and things like that. And so at this stage of my life, I really just want to work on things that I think will be positive um, and will make people feel better when they walk out of the theater. Um, so I, I'm, I'm kind of picky about that. But at this stage of my life, that's the only thing I want to do. And I want to help people get work out into the world. Fair enough. Fair enough. Now, as a producer, you've done a lot of big movies and, and all sorts of different movies in the studio system and outside. Is there a day that you feel that the entire you felt like the entire production was coming crashing down around you? I know that feels like every day, uh, but was there one day or one film in, in a day in the film that you were just like, I don't know how we're going to get over this. Like, how are we going to continue? What was that thing and how did you overcome it? Um. There were a few of those. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm, I can't go into the details of this because I don't think it would be appropriate at this point uh, because some of the people that were involved in this in a very significant way are no longer with us. Okay. And I don't think I should do that. But I, and so I'm not going to specify the film. But we did have, uh, I, did, I was working on a film that we had to shut down production in the middle of a day. Um, we had an amazing crisis with the cast um, and with the director and um, with extras in the film. And um, I had to call the studio to get permission to shut it down. Um, the people involved who were making the, the I'm not going to be specific, but some of the people who were making the film were very unhappy with me. Um, I actually thought I was going to get fired. Um, and I, it's only because the person who was actually running the financing entity knew how long it had taken me 
to get what dreams may come made because it took me 20 years mm -hmm. and there was no way in the world that he was going to let me be fired but i i thought the movie might not continue and i thought i probably wouldn't continue so i definitely remember that um i, I worked on a film many many years ago in which there was a horrible accident um and um actually somebody wound up getting killed oh wow and somebody wound up being um in a wheelchair for life oh, wow. um that haunts me to this day um so yeah i i definitely had definitely had those moments where i thought all, all is lost and did you and and like that day that you had to shut down the production how did you get that over like how did you overcome that like how did you get the well, how do you rally the, back the entire crew and the cast and the get that engine the, up again you know we dealt with it um fortunately we were dealing with very very professional people and uh it was rough uh it definitely drove a wedge uh between me and um one member of the cast in particular um that never really totally got healed um it, it was a really really challenging thing but you know people who work on film are in general are incredibly hardworking professional people mm -hmm. and the idea that the show must go on is deeply deeply ingrained uh particularly in the crews you know the the grips and the electricians are the hardest working people on sets as i think everybody knows um, and they have an incredible work ethic. You know, this is what we're here to do. Um, and everyone got together and the movie uh, moved on from that. But uh, it always stayed in my mind, it stayed in my heart. And it's something that I regret and I wish I'd been able to do something differently. I don't regret that I shut the film down. I had to and the studio agreed that I had to, but uh, I regret that that happened. And um, even now, thinking back on it, it was a it was a pretty rough moment. But I, unfortunately, I didn't have too many of those. Thank God for that. But you know, this is a, this is a lesson for people listening. If if you're a filmmaker, sometimes you got to make these tough choices. You got to either continue down the path that might destroy the film, or stop, reassess, and start up again. And that's that's a brave it's a brave move. It's a brave move. But it's a lot of times it's something that needs to be done. And I, I would also say to people who are um, who want to be producers or maybe are producers, um, I had um, and it didn't stand me in great stead with studios, and I understand why. Um, I don't blame them. Um, I did my my loyalty on a film was always to the director. Um, I always saw my job as being able to help the director put the vision on screen that the director wanted to put on screen. And I became very good friends um, with all of our directors. I mean, Jeannot, Swark and I, Jeannot is retired now in, in France and Jeannot I think is in his early 80s. Um, Jeannot and I still stay in touch um, until his uh, tragic passing. I stayed in touch with Michael Chapman all the time on All the Right Moves. Um, Vincent Ward who directed What Dreams May Come uh, is a dear, dear friend of mine. We talk all the time. And I wanted to have friendships with these people because I saw that as my job. Now, the studio will tell you it's your job to do what the studio wants you to do. <laughs> and I respect that. I respect that. Um, but the films that I'm the most proud of, Summer in Time um, and What Dreams May Come in particular, because those are the films that I feel I came to this life to make. Mm -hmm. Other films I made because I needed to make a living, and I'm still proud of them, very proud of them. Um, there are a couple I'm not so proud of, but we won't go into those. Um, most of them I'm very proud of, and I'm glad that I got involved. But to me, a producer's job is to nurture the director, unless the director really goes off the rails, and then you, you know, you've got to try to do something to bring them back. Fortunately, that never happened with me. I never had a director go off the rails. Um, and it was in a fantastic career. I don't do it anymore. I don't produce films anymore. I'm 76 years old. Um, I've been out of Hollywood for 20 years. I moved to Oregon 20 years ago, um, wrote a couple of books, founded the Spiritual Cinema Circle, which we operated for 16 years in distributing really uplifting material to people. So the only way I keep my hand in now is through my mentoring program, uh, 
mm-hmm. um, which people can take a look at if you're interested at theoldhollywood.com, T-H-E-O-L-D, hollywood.com. Um, it is a rigorous program. Um, I spend 20 to 25 hours a month um, working with directly with the writers, uh, one time with a producer who wound up getting her film made. Um, and it is something that, that if people are interested in, you should take a look at that page. And if you're interested, fill in the, uh, the questionnaire that will come to me and then you know, we can have a conversation about it. But I don't work with that many people at a time. Uh, it's only usually two or three. And uh, if people are interested, we, they can do that. And if not, I hope you enjoy the films that I made in the past. Which brings me to one of my favorite films that you've produced ever, which is What Dreams May Come. And that film, I just recently saw it when I knew you were going to come back on the show or come on the show. I was like, you know, let me go watch it again. I haven't seen it in a while. And it still holds up so beautifully. It's actually probably deep. It it hit me harder now than it did when I, you know, many years ago when I saw it. And it's just one of those films that, that sticks, at least it sticks to my bones. It sticks, it sticks hard. And even more so now because of Robin's passing uh, all those years ago, and how, what a powerful message that whole movie was and, and Robin Williams and everything. How did you get that film? Which that wasn't a cheap film to make, by the way. It was, a, it was a, from what I understand, it was a fairly expensive film to get off yeah, the ground. Yeah, 80, 80, $85 million. Right. So I, I know Robin was the, the catalyst for getting that movie made, but how did Robin get involved? How did you get this to Robin? How did you get the whole thing oh, off the ground? Goodness. All right, so we literally don't have enough time to tell that story, that whole story, because that was literally 20 years of my life. Wow. Richard gave me, Richard Mathis gave me the galleys for What Dreams May Come when we were prepping somewhere in time Jeez. in 1980. And uh, the film didn't get shot until 1997 and 98. Um, the adventures we went through with that were pretty extraordinary. Um, almost every well-known director in the film industry turned it down. Um, One in particular wanted to do it, but we couldn't come to an agreement about where it was going to be done, which was a whole other story um, Mm -hmm. that I don't want to waste time with now. Uh, We finally thought we had a green light at Fox in the mid eighties with a wonderful director named Wolfgang Peterson. But that fell through, Uh, the regime changed and everything got changed and it just took forever, forever and ever and ever for me to find the right person to do it. I'll tell you what the catalyst was. When I was running Dino's company, we hired Ron Bass to write an original script. I've never told this story um, uh, on a podcast or in public before. So Uh I'm going to tell it now. And um, it is, it's an amazing Hollywood story. So we hired Ron to write the script. Ron is the, the most professional writer you can possibly imagine and a great man, a great man. We had known each other for a very long time. When Ron was a lawyer, before he even started writing, we, we knew each other and were friends. So we hired Ron to write this script. Dino did not like the first draft at all. And, um, and I said, well, we'll have Ron in, tell him what you want. Ron will make whatever changes you want him to make because that's who he is. And Dino was like, no, this isn't the movie he sold us. And, you know, I, I want to get our money back. I don't want to move forward. I said, we can't do that, Dino. I mean, we've made a commitment. And Ron came in, Dino, and Ron was wonderful. Dino did not want to go forward. And I sided with Ron. And it was a, a, a painful moment, um, but there was no way we could not do that. And when Ron left the office, Dino fired me. And he had every reason to fire me. He was right in firing me because I was there to support him. And I, I, I understand why he fired me. Um, Ron felt terrible about it and tried to make it right, but it didn't work out, fade out. A few months later, Ron calls me to find out how I'm doing. And um, I, he said, is there anything I can do? And I said, yeah, I've, I've finally come to a point in the development of what dreams may come that 
I believe, and I, I, I need to talk to the writer, Richard Matheson, about this, Ron, but I need a major writer like you to come in and do a rewrite on this. And I would really appreciate it if you would take this over. And he was like, Stephen, nobody, it, nobody's going to set that movie up. It, he had read the book because he was a friend of mine. He says, it's an incredible book. And I'm sure we can make it into an incredible movie, but my God, there are so many issues. And I said, I really want you to do this. I went to Richard Mathis and I told him what I wanted to do. He gave me the permission to do it. And Ron said, okay, look, I'll, I'll give you one pitch. One pitch, we'll do one pitch. And I said, okay. So we went to MGM. Mike Marcus was running the studio at that time. David Ladd was one of the executives there. Everyone wanted to be in business with Ron. As we're driving to the meeting, I said to Ron, Ron, what are we gonna do about the suicide? And, cause it was always the biggest problem in the book. Right. In, the book of, in the book of what dreams may come, Annie commits suicide while the children are still alive. Chris has died. Annie in grief takes her own life, leaving two children parentless and orphans. And I knew, we all knew that we could not do that. It, it doesn't work. And he said, I haven't even thought about it. And believe me, they're not even gonna ask, okay? So I, I don't have an answer to the question. So we go into the meeting, Ron is doing his thing, which was, you, you could have sold tickets to watch Ron pitch. He was, it was a, a lesson in genius. And we get to the end of it. And of course, Mike Marcus says, this is fantastic, Ron. This sounds great, Stephen. I know it's taken you forever to do this. Ron, I just have one question. What are you going to do about the suicide? <laughs> and I thought, oh, shit. David said to me, but my face just drained of blood at that point. And w next to me, sitting on the couch, Ron just instinctively says, you know, I think I know what to do about that. We'll have the kids die. We'll have the kids die earlier. Um, and that's why Annie tries to take her life. And Chris and her love for Chris is what stops her from doing that. So Chris won't die first. The children will before the movie. We'll show that in flashback. And he said, now that I'm thinking about it, when they get into the afterlife, they can be anybody. We can change their appearance. They can be anybody and we'll do that. He'll have great reunions with his kids and we'll understand why she took her life because now her kids and her husband have died. There's no way in the world that people won't understand it. And it, we wound up making some adjustments to that. But Mike said, that's brilliant. You got a deal. And we walked out of the office and I looked at Ron and Ron, you can see my hand. <laughs> shaking. And I said, what, the, how, where did that come from? And he was pale as a ghost too. And he said, I have no idea where that came from. I have no idea. It just came out. Well, I think we do know where it came from. The universe <laughs> stepped in and said, you know, Stephen, AKA Forrest, uh, you may not be the smartest guy in the whole world, and you're certainly not the quickest guy in the whole world, but we're going to give you a little boost here. The cap on that story is that we're walking out of MGM, and Ron, who knew everybody, um, there was one guy sitting in the waiting room, um, uh, as, you, as you once said to me, uh, the, the uh, water bottle tour. The water bottle tour, um, yes. Yes. Yeah, um, he was sitting for a meeting with somebody else. And I just casually said to Ron, who is that? And he said, that's a director from New Zealand named Vincent Ward. And I looked him up later and Vincent eventually became the director for What Dreams May Come. So for people who believe in coincidence, okay, fine. I don't believe that was a coincidence. I don't believe that was an accident. I believe that movie was had found its time to get made. Right. And universe, our angels, our guides, whatever you want, to say stepped in and gave us the answer to the biggest problem in the book. And then we went forward, we gave the, the, the script to Robin uh, who had just made um, the movie that he got the Academy Award for. Goodwill Hunting. Uh, yeah, Goodwill Hunting. 
Um, and he was looking to do something like this, we thought. Um, we offered him the script. Uh, we got a phone call that the director and I were supposed to come meet him in San Francisco, which we did. <laughs> Robin walked into the meeting and he said, well, uh, this is going to be my next movie, guys, but I want to tell you, there's a little bit of a twist here. I'm going to play every part in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> Was he serious? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, thank God. <laughs> no. But uh, at that point, we would say, okay, <laughs> because we needed a star of his stature and with the visual effects in the film, which again, I had nothing to do with. That was certainly Vincent and our production designer and the great effects people who won an Academy Award for it. It was beautiful, um, stunning. Th that was an amazing experience watching that, all of that happen. And it was not an easy shoot because it's, it's not an easy movie. Um, it is not an easy movie. And there were, I'll tell you one great story from it. And um, we were prepping the movie. Do you remember the scene when Robin finally is getting closer to, to uh, Annabella? And he gets to this place where he walks over this sea of faces. Yes. I was going to ask okay. you about that. <laughs> All right. So um, someone in the art department, and I will not name who it was because to this day, Vincent doesn't know who it is. And I was sworn to secrecy. But someone in the art department came to me and said, have you seen the sketches for this? And I said, no. So he showed me the sketches. And I was like, no way are we doing that. So I went to Vincent. Um, Vincent and I had a fabulous relationship. We had many arguments, but they were never personal. It was always about the film. And we never got angry at each other. We just got angry at the, uh, at, at, about what we were arguing about. So I said, Vincent, this is a love story. Okay, that's going to scare the crap out of people. You know, it's just a bridge too far. We can't do that kind of thing. So we got into this big argument. Uh, I later found out we were in the production office at that time um, up in San Francisco where we were prepping. And uh, I think it was in Oakland we had the office actually. Um, we learned that the production assistants and everybody went out in the parking lot because the producer and director sounded like they were gonna kill each other. So we're yelling at each other back and forth. And finally, Vincent says to me, Stephen, this is a movie about a man who goes through hell to save his wife's soul. He does not go through heck. And I cracked up. <laughs> we both wound up rolling on the floor crying. We were laughing so hard. Oh, Needless to say, he won the argument. When we previewed that film, you know, when you do preview cards, people are asked to, to note, among other things, what their favorite scene is and what their least favorite scene is. That scene got the most votes in every preview for both. Wow. Favorite scene and least favorite scene. And at that point, I knew that Vincent had been right all along, that we needed to do that. Uh, he was totally right. I was totally wrong. But no, it's not about a man who goes through heck. He does go through hell. But in that scene, there is a cameo by a young director, if I'm not mistaken, Werner Herzog. Oh yeah, I, it, it's in that scene. I, like I remember, like as as I was watching the movie, like a week or two ago, I see Robin Williams and I hear this voice, which is so distinctive. And then as I'm watching the credits, I'm like, "That was Werner Werner Herzog." Like, what? How did that I, happen? I had actually, you know what? You're right. I'd actually forgotten that Werner was a good friend of Vincent's, and um, and did that as a favor to Vincent. And you know, Vincent was a huge fan of Werner and his work. Right. Um, I had completely forgotten that that was the case. You're right. Yeah. And so he, that's how he, he was just like a favor. Like, hey, you want to come in and just do a quick line? Yes. yes. <laughs> that's amazing. So, uh, you know, Max Von Cito played the tracker. Oh, God, and no. um, what an incredible actor, an incredible gentleman. My goodness. You know, the old actors, man, they they had such a, a sense of professionalism and style. So he's hired to do that. His first scene is in the library sequence where he oh, is on wires in this big, heavy overcoat. <laughs> and I hadn't even met him. So I went into the set to find him and he's up there hanging by these wires. And I yell up at him, Max, I'm Steven Simon. I'm the producer of the movie. And he looked down at me very drolly and said, thanks so much for hiring me. 
<laughs> he, he was a great, 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 great guy. So, and it, it was, that was a fascinating shoot, but a very challenging one because of the subject matter. A very, so, very challenging one. When, so Robin let me went up, when Robin went up to do the eulogy uh -huh. oh. his in the church with those two coffins in front oh. of him, a lot oh. of our crew would not go into that set because they, they were so spooked by it. When Robin went up to do that, that, he took pictures of his own kids up to the podium and had them in front of him while he was doing that scene. And it, it shows because it's such an incredibly powerful, but a, an incredibly painful scene. That's a, the movie is not a light comedy, that's for sure. No, it's, it's not a light comedy at all. And, and there are some you know, humorous moments in the movie, but, but generally definitely not a comedy. And I, I wanted to ask you about Robin because you know, obviously Robin's a legend and I've heard many, I know many people who've worked with Robin over the years and, you know, Robin is, he had that energy that was just nonstop. And he would, even in dramatic scenes, in dramatic films like Goodwill Hunting, he would, before the camera rolled, he's cracking the entire room up because he had to, because that was his mission in life. Uh, and, and then the second the election, boom, he's, in character, I think a uh, um, one hour photo was like that. He would be, I mean, I, I've seen some behind the scenes. He was literally on second he yells action. He's into this and he just goes right into his thing. What was it like on set with Robin Williams on that film? Because again, you know, it's a it heavy was, movie. It was not like that on our show. Um, mm -hmm. Robin was, you know, Robin was always incredibly kind and generous to everybody. He was always very respectful of the crew and the other actors and things like that. But this was a really heavy lift for the actors. I mean, a very heavy lift. And um, Robin was very much in character for most of it. And so many of those scenes are such heart-rending, heart-rending scenes that um, there wasn't that, I mean, there was banter and there was, they had fun at times, but mostly Robin was really, Robin and Cuba and Annabella were very much uh, into their roles and their roles were very emotionally draining for all of them. So there wasn't as much of that on our film as I understand there were on other films with Robin. Well, it is, again, thank you for bringing that into the world because it is one of those films that has definitely- well, I'm, I'm very, 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 very proud of that movie. I'm very proud of that movie for just, for what it took to get it done, for the messages within it, um, that life continues after life. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it, it, it's something I, I'm, I'm incredibly proud of. And uh, I, I'm really glad that it has also lasted the test of time and that uh, people still watch it, people still buy it. And um, I hope they will. It is not for everybody. I understand that. Um, it's but it's, the people it's who heavy. Are open to it, it's a powerful film. No, it, it is, and it's 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 not a light film. It's a heavy film. Um, Very heavy. A beautiful, beautiful ending. Wonderful ending. So touching, and but it it you you literally go through heck uh, to get to that point. Yeah, no, you definitely do. And again, I give all the credit on that. To, really, ninety percent of that credit goes to Vincent, mm -hmm. um, because just having the cojones to take on that movie. Um, and to say, okay, I can do this. We're going to spend most of the movie in an afterlife setting. Um, he changed a, a bunch of the characters. He made Annie into this museum curator, art museum curator, so that we could tie in the paintings more. It was Vincent's idea that when Robin came in to the afterlife, it would be in a world of wet paint and oh. he would be the only human in it. I remember saying, Vincent, that's just beyond brilliant. Can we do that? And he said, yeah, of course we can do that. And I said, do you know how? He said, hell no, but we'll figure it out. And he was right. They figured it out. I mean, it was it was really cutting edge stuff that the effects guys did on that film. And it made it really, really beautiful. I mean, truly beautiful. And, um, you know, Robin's line with the Dalmatian <laughs> in the beginning, you know, I screwed up, I'm in dog heaven. Um, that was in the script, but Robin really, Robin really gave it his own twist. And the same thing with the line at the end, you know, I could find you and I found you in hell, I can find you in Jersey. 
Um, <laughs> you know, that, that is Robin Williams stuff. Um, and again, I'm very, very proud of that movie and I'm glad it touched you and moved you. Absolutely. It's one of those films that just, it always sits in the back of my head is it's on my top 10 of all time. Uh, it's just one of those films that just, there aren't movies made like that, uh, at, at that level, at that budget level with that kind of caliber of actor, uh, and people behind the scenes as well. It's just not a movie that gets made, uh, and less, lesser now. I mean, a movie like that would never get made in today's no, and world. Look, the movie did not make money. I mean, the movie wound <laughs> up losing money because it did not do as well at the box office as it needed to do, but it reached the audience that it reached that, uh, that I knew would touch it. And, you know, that's why I saw again, my role as a producer differently. And, and, and frankly, it, it did not, it did not augur well for a long-term career for me in producing <laughs> right. because I was really focused on making these spiritual films and getting this love after life concept in front of people to make people realize that it does go on, mm -hmm. that after life there is more. Mm -hmm. And um, I know we'll talk about this at another time that wound up happening in my life sure. with my wife. And um, I, I, she wound up transitioning in her sleep, uh, which is a big surprise. She was only 54. Oh, and wow. um, when that happened, um, she and I had always talked about these things that we would find a way to communicate. We always thought I would go first because I was significantly older. Um, but it happened with her. And six weeks later, she started to communicate with me. And we wrote a book together uh, called What Dreams, ha what Dreams Have Come. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, again, it's a book that I wrote with her after she crossed over. So there are people that think that I am several um, egg rolls short of a combination plate. The cheese, the cheese, um, slid, off, the cheese slid off the cracker, sir, as they say. Uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> if there ever was a cracker. Um, and, and that's okay with me because I know in my heart that this is real. It continues to this day mm -hmm. and it has sustained me. And I really feel that my primary role in life has been to bring these kind of concepts onto film, whether they wind up being mainstream concepts or not, and they weren't, and they don't have to be. I've never been in my heart, what I would call a mainstream producer. That has not been my goal. It should have been, and my career was shorter because of that, but I don't regret that in any way because I'm really, really, really proud of what we did. Now, Stephen, um, I'm gonna ask you a few questions, ask all my guests. Um, what advice would you give a filmmaker trying to break into the business today? Don't be, the first thing I would say is don't be so committed to having your film play in a theater. <laughs> because that, and that has been the case for years. That was the case before the pandemic. So hard for all kinds of reasons to get a movie made at all. And then to get it in wide distribution in theaters, it's really like, going through the eye of the needle. Mm -hmm. And because of the pandemic, that's even been um, more uh, magnified. Mm -hmm. And there are so many great venues now, like Amazon, like Hulu, like Showtime, like HBO, uh, Apple TV, whatever it might be, Peacock, HBO Max, all those things. And particularly with the longer forms now of doing series, writers have an opportunity to really develop characters um, in a way that you can't do in a two hour film. Um, and also there is such a huge voluminous need for material that if you're not focused on getting your movie in a theater and you're not writing, you don't have a right to a Marvel comic character <laughs> or you're not doing a sequel to a very, you know, to other big movies, it is very hard to get movies made and shown in theaters today for all kinds of reasons. So that's the first thing I would say, which is write for the audience that you think will be right for this. And don't worry about what the distribution mechanism will be, because um, there was a wonderful producer whose name I cannot 
come up with right now that once said, if you write a great script, you can throw it out of your car on the San Diego freeway and the right producer will find it. If you have the right idea, you will find a way to get it done as long as you're persistent. And that's the other thing. You can't give up. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's your third, fourth, fifth, or sixth script that you wind up selling. And even that may not get made and it may not get made in the way you want it to get made, but you keep moving forward. If you believe in yourself and this is what you do, if it's in your heart, if you want to be in the film industry because you think it would be a really cool way to make a lot of money, uh, <laughs> I will tell you it isn't. Um, <laughs> if you think it will be a way for you to feel better about yourself or something else, or however you may look at it, if you're not getting in for the sole reason that this is the way you need to express yourself and you cannot imagine yourself in any other life than that, that is what, when you do that, I'm telling you, you're going to get your opportunity. At some point or another, if you hang in there long enough, you will get an opportunity. But you have to live it, love it, breathe it, and be willing to give up a whole lot of different things in your life to get your film made. Eventually, you'll get your chance to do it. And, you know, there are other things that, but I would say those would be the two things, which is never give up. And don't be in love with the thought of your movie getting into a movie theater. You know, okay. I know a lot of us grew up with the idea of sitting in a movie theater and being surrounded by that. Very hard to get that done nowadays. And I, I would say don't focus on that. Oh, if you want to do that, rent, rent the theater yourself and then you have that experience. <laughs> that, absolutely. Ab absolutely. No question. Now, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film industry or in life? I, I could say the thing that took me the longest to learn, I never learned. Mm -hmm. Which and is? that is, I never understood the technical aspects of the film industry. I, I, I directed a couple of small films, the, the, the adaptation of Conversations with God, um, and I never could figure out anything about the technical aspect of camera lenses. It just somehow wouldn't compute in my brain. <laughs> I had no concept of lighting. I, we hired a wonderful cinematographer that did all that. Um, in editing, I, I had great editors, thank God, because I just didn't understand how I would put certain things together and how they would technically do some of the things that they did. Uh, to put this shortly, I am a tech moron. Mm -hmm. And uh, I never learned that stuff. And I think it's important for producers to understand a lot of that stuff today, particularly today, that stuff I never learned. So I think the thing it took me longest to learn, I have never learned. And at this age, I probably never will. Fair enough, sir. Fair enough. And finally, three of your favorite films of all time. Lost Horizon, the original one, the mm -hmm. 1931, the Frank Capra version, and The Godfather. Not a bad list at all, my friend. Stephen, thank you so much for coming on the show. Well, being I so have to say if there was a 3A. Yes. If it was a 3A, and I'm, not, yeah. I'm excluding movies that I was involved with. If sure. there was a 3A, it would be Avatar. Really? Yeah, Avatar. Uh, yeah. It's, because the, the, what he did with that film, and that's why I cannot wait to see the sequels, that was a game changer extraordinaire. I have never experienced anything like that in a movie theater. To me, that is what movie theaters and IMAX yes. and 3D were created to be. And I, I thought that was more than a film, it was an absolutely awesome experience. So I would put I would put Avatar right up there as 3A. Fair enough, fair enough. Now, Stephen, again, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing uh, your, your knowledge, your experiences, your amazing stories uh, on the show. And, uh, and thank you for putting all this amazing work out over the years to, uh, to hopefully uplift uh, society a bit. So I appreciate you, my friend. Thank you again. You're welcome. A Alex, thank you for doing this. This has been really great fun. Thank you for putting up because you learned before we started this interview, how technically idiotic and inept I am. <laughs> <laughs> how do you get onto a Zoom call? It's just, anyway, thank you for being patient. I really enjoyed doing this and uh, I look forward to doing more in the future.